This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. We are absolutely so excited, peacock proud and hippopotamus happy to be here tonight to celebrate our graduates um, at our 2022 cross-cultural celebration. We are just um, so excited for each one of you all, so proud of you. And tonight we take this moment to honor all of our students of color for your accomplishments, the blood, sweat, tears, and prayers that you have put in over the years for this particular moment and beyond, because we know that ministry is just getting started after, after a graduation. And so um, we say to God be the glory for what God has done. And again, this is our opportunity on behalf of all of the centers of McCormick Theological Seminary. Of course, our president who is about to come forward as well as the board we, tonight, we congratulate each one of you and we celebrate and honor you for the work that you've done and for your accomplishments. At this time, going, I'm going to turn it over to our president, uh, David Crawford. Thank you, Dr. Stacy. Welcome everybody. It's great to see you all, to be able to be together tonight, even in this virtual space for what is always a very special event. Uh, I, I wanna, first of all, just take a moment to thank our amazing Reverend Priscilla Rodriguez, Reverend Dr. Stacy Edwards Dunn, Reverend Dr. Leslie Diaz Perez, and Reverend Dr. Daesung Kim, our IT and communications teams who make all of this possible. Friends, I'm honored tonight to have been asked to introduce our very special guest, and we will do that. Uh, Leslie, I need to check on the schedule. Are we, is, are we going to Dr. Moss later? In a little bit. Okay, so I will just stop there and just say welcome to each and every one of you to an event that year after year is one of the truly uh, special events that McCormick gets to do. So welcome everybody. Would you join me in prayer and saying thanks to God for this day? Oh God, how great and wonderful are the works of your hand. As we gather here today to celebrate, we just say thank you. Thank you for all the ways that you have showed up and showed out. Thank you for all the ways that you have supplied and provided. Thank you for all the ways that you have helped each and every single one of these students. God, we just, today, we gather, we celebrate, but we celebrate your work in each of us as we continue to listen and hear all the testimonies that will come forth. They are just confirmation that you have always provided and made a way. So God, uh, we welcome you in the space, take dominion and control of everything that we do and let it be for your honor and for your glory. It is in your son's name, Jesus, that we pray. And the people say, amen, amen, and amen. We have the scriptures now, Reverend Stacy. I'm gonna read our scripture. I have some background noise from the twins. That's my congregation who is praising the Lord in the back. Uh, our scripture reading tonight comes from Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, which says this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. May the Lord have a blessing on the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. All of God's people say, amen, amen. We don't forget that God has special plans for each of us. Um, as we continue to uh, meditate in the word and meditate on what each of that means to us, uh, the chat is open, say amen, put the little hands, do, this is a day to celebrate, and we are celebrating 
God's work in your life. Um, it's okay to open up your mic. It's okay to, that's okay. This is a celebration. This is a celebration. Can anyone say amen? Amen. 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 Has amen. God, amen. Has God done something in your life? Amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. Glory to Dios. There you go. Glory to God. Today we are have we're going to have people from north, south, east, and west. We have people from all over. So uh, just let us know where you're watching from, where you are uh, right now located, to let us know that you are here. We have people from Pennsylvania. Is Chicago in the house? <laughs> Bronzeville? Olympia Fields, South Holland, Madison, Illinois, Phoenix. Phoenix is in the house. Phoenix, Arizona, South Holland, High Park. Yes. <laughs> Stagger, Rogers Park, Merrillville, Indiana. That's where I'm at right now. Amen. So thank you, friends, for gathering from north, south, east, and west. Thank you so much for. Uh, making this day, Homewood, I see you, Homewood, for making this today a day to celebrate. So we celebrate all of our graduates, whether you are graduating from the Black Church Study Certificate Program, the Masters of Theological Studies, Masters of Divinity, Ma Doctor of Ministry, we, we greet you. We acknowledge you today. Thank you so much. Madison is in the house, West Town, Chicago. By way of Puerto Rico, part of the African diaspora, we see you, Reverend Marilyn Pagan Banks. Amen. And we say to that, wepa. Wepa. <laughs> this is wepa. a celebration. <laughs> oh, I hear, uh, I think, Lise Valle as well. Inglewood, glory coming through. Okay, Miss Valerie. This is a celebration. Barrington, Illinois, Richton Park. We see you. We see you. We celebrate you. I think this is the time that we uh, turn it over to David Crawford, our president, uh, for the introduction of our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Leslie. Uh, again, friends, welcome. This is a uh, a great, great privilege to be with you all tonight on this very, very special occasion. Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III is truly one of those people who needs no introduction. The senior pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ here in Chicago, Dr. Moss has been a devoted friend of McCormick, an inspiration to all of us, and we are grateful beyond measure. Dr. Moss grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, he is a proud honors graduate of Morehouse College, earned his MDiv at Yale Divinity School and Doctor of Ministry degree from Chicago Theological Seminary. In 2014, he presented the renowned Lyman Beecher Lectures at Yale University. The three-day lectures became the basis of Dr. Moss's 2015 book, Blue Note Preaching in a Post-Soul World, Finding Hope in an Age of Despair. Dr. Moss is a hugely popular speaker on college and university campuses, at conferences, at seminaries and churches across the country, indeed around the globe. Friends, it is my distinct honor to introduce our very special guest, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III. Dr. Moss, welcome back to McCormick. We are so glad to see you. Thank you so much, Brendan Crawford. It is a delight to be with you on this evening. For, for this celebration. Uh, my, my apologies for my tardiness. 
my daughter was going off for prom. Uh, and so I was designated to take some pictures and to drop her off uh, for prom. Uh, so I just want to let you know that she got off well. She looked beautiful and all of that. And uh, I'm so grateful to also have this opportunity for this celebration with the students of McCormick. And we are grateful for the work of McCormick, and we are deeply tied to the institution. Though uh, we are not Presbyterian, uh, we are uh, connected to the Presbyterian community, and we are thankful that uh, Reverend Dr. Stacy Edwards Dunn is a part of the McCormick community, uh, along with a long list of Trinitarians who not only serve at McCormick, uh, who work at McCormick, uh, who are custodial at McCormick, um, every, everything, you name it, there, there is a Trinitarian running around there somewhere. And so uh, we are deeply bound and connected uh, to the institution. And I am absolutely honored to have this opportunity uh, to share uh, with the students through this cross-cultural uh, uh, celebration uh, for students of, of, of color. We are just so appreciative uh, very much for having this space, uh, for having this space. I would just for the few moments that we have, uh, want to, to lift up uh, a passage of scripture uh, coming uh, from the gospel according to Luke. And I want to lift it up uh, in a very special way. It is from the eighth chapter um, but it is the translation uh, that Clarence Jordan uh, would give uh, from Americus, Georgia, uh, along with what I would call the OM3 translation. Clarence Jordan was a brilliant New Testament scholar, uh, lived in Americus, Georgia, uh, was an anti-racist before there was the term anti-racist, creating a community of people who simply believed uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he attempted to translate before his passing uh, the, uh, the New Testament in Southern verse, uh, where you can just read in a wonderful way uh, the way in which he writes uh, the, the New Testament in such a beautiful, beautiful way. And he's probably one of the um, uh, underrated but yet finest uh, preachers and thinkers of the 20th century uh, rode around on a Harley all throughout Georgia, created a farm. And when the Klan showed up in Americus and says, what you're doing is anti-God and communist, uh, he just started rattling off scripture to the Klansmen and just said, uh, you need to go on about your business uh, because we're doing the work of God here, uh, raising food and also raising our uh, hearts and souls. And so in the eighth chapter, uh, this translation uh, goes a little bit about uh, that there was, was a sister uh, who uh, had some medical issues and none of the doctors uh, in Atlanta could do anything about it. Uh, and so she heard uh, that there was a rabbi and a teacher uh, who had come from the Southern portion of Georgia uh, who was able uh, to heal people. And she decided to step out of, of her arena and touch uh, the hem of his garment. And it was this rabbi um, by the name of Jesus who said, who touched me? And all of his crew in cadre, uh, OM3 translation, his boys were like, there, there's too many people around here. How could you know that? How could you know that someone is pressing on you? He ignored them and he witnessed this woman, this sister, who then fell on her knees and told all of her truth. And he said, daughter, uh, your faith has made you well. Go and do likewise. Daughter, uh, your faith has made you well. Go and do likewise. Uh, I'd like to just for a few moments to just deal with this simple idea of we have nothing to lose uh, as you are stepping out into a new moment of ministry and opportunity and possibility and risk uh, as faith and risk are one in the same uh, that we recognize that we have nothing to lose. 
As uh, President Crawford already had mentioned, I am a child of a space known as Ohio, particularly uh, Cleveland. Uh, and when I was growing up in Cleveland, Ohio as a small child, it was my, uh, my godfather by the name of Alfred Warren who would take myself along with my god brother Carlin Warren to uh, the circus every year. I'm not talking about any just simple circus. I'm talking about that Barnum and Bailey three ring circus. I loved going to the circus every single year. Uh, I loved everything about the circus. Uh, I loved the clowns that would pack into a small little car and maybe 11 of them might pop out of this car. I love the trapeze artists. I loved everything about the circus. I love the lions. I love the tigers. I love the bears. Oh my, I loved everything uh, there is to know about the circus. But there was one particular uh, uh, animal that I absolutely found fascinating uh, when I was growing up. And that was, that was the elephants. They were, they were so incredibly majestic. They were so incredibly beautiful on so many levels and powerful. But, but I was always nervous every time the elephants came out because we usually had good seats, uh, thankfully because of my godfather. Uh, we were usually on the third row. He got a hookup somehow. I'm not quite sure how. And I was always worried that when the elephants came out, that there would be an elephant coup d'etat that would take place. Be because there was the only thing stopping the elephants from making its way their way into, into the audience and to the bleachers uh, was simply a man who had a whip and a chair. It made absolutely no sense to me how a man who did not have as much power a man who did not have as much authority, a man who did not have as much strength, could keep these elephants in line who were built and designed and destined to be more, to have more strength and power and majesty than this tiny little man. And I was worried every time, but it was my godfather who said to me, oh, Otis, you don't, you don't need to worry. He said, because you must understand something about these elephants. Uh, that these elephants, uh, when they were, were kidnapped from uh, the region from which they, were, which they came from, uh, when they arrived, whether it was in the United States or in any other particular uh, country, that they were always brought as children and they were trained as small elephants. There was a chain that was placed around their neck. And there was a chain roughly 12 feet in length um, that was connected to a post so that the elephant would develop and grow thinking that the chain was a limitation upon its possibility. They would never move beyond 12 feet, thinking that's as far as they could go. And they would be trained to think that the person standing in front of them had more authority, had more power, and had more strength than them. He explained to me, he said that uh, literally that the elephants were colonized and miseducated to think that they did not have as much power or authority. And as a result, when the elephant got a certain age, they would release the chains. The elephant would be emancipated, but the elephant was not liberated. And the elephant would then make the assumption that I only have the ability to move roughly about 12 feet in length. And so you don't have to worry about these elephants because they have been trained since they were small to never start a revolution. Even though they've been emancipated from their chains, they still have chains around their neck. But this is what my godfather said to me, and I will never forget it because it rests in my spirit as he now rests with God. He said, now, Otis, the elephant you got to worry about is the elephant that recognizes I don't have nothing to lose. As soon as I realize that uh, your whip can't hurt me, your chain can't stop me, uh, and you know that uh, that chair has no authority over me, then there's about an elephant revolution that's about to take place. And in this moment and day and age and ministry, in this moment in America, we need people in ministry. Though we have been <laughs> emancipated, we no longer need miseducated people operating with a doctrinal perspective that keeps them chained and in their place. We need people who recognize they have nothing to lose to step beyond the limitations that have been framed upon you and upon your spirit by systems and by people who do not want to see you flourish nor see you thrive. And that is why this scripture is so powerful. 
and so beautiful. And if I may excavate it just for a quick moment, uh, before we dive into it with depth, I was uh, brought to some new enlightenment around the scripture by an incredible uh, scholar by the name of Will DeGaffney from Texas. And as Dr. Will DeGaffney, who wrote The Womanist Midrash, explained something about the way in which we understand scripture, especially through the lens of looking at sisters in scripture. And she said that those who had issues of blood and those who had leprosy, uh, we have a tendency within the American context to always use the term unclean. But unclean really is not an appropriate translation from Hebrew into English, uh, because unclean within English actually has a moral framework. When you say someone is unclean, you are also not saying something physical. You are also saying something moral and spiritual and mental about that individual. She said it's more appropriate to say that the person lived in restriction, that they lived in a restricted community because they were lepers. They lived in a restricted restrictive area because they had an issue of blood. They were restricted from participating fully within society because people had determined that there were particular conditions that they could contract. She says, use the term restriction because in English, when you use the term unclean, you are also making a moral claim simultaneously as you are trying to make a biological observation about an individual within scripture. And so I say not that this woman was unclean. This, this woman was restricted. She had an issue of blood and therefore uh, she was living in a restricted community with other people who had issues because a male dominant clergy had already determined that you are to live in this particular space. So therefore you are restricted. Isn't it interesting that the sisters did not have a say in reference to whether or not they were to be restricted. And so it was the brothers that said that you are to be restricted. And so this woman who is is living restricted. And what is interesting, if you to read the NIV version or Clarence Jordan's version, you will find out that the woman heard about Jesus. Mm, that's the beautiful thing here, that she heard about Jesus. She's living in restriction because anyone who has an issue of blood, continuous bleeding, or has a leprosy, has something that people do not quite understand. And the reason they had this person on restriction is because they already understood the mystery and the power of blood. That blood has the power of life and death. They knew that if you put blood on a doorpost, that the spirit of death could pass over your household before you were even before you even left out of the place known as Egypt. And this woman was living in restriction. But what is so powerful about this, and what I think is central in reference to ministry, is that she's living with other people. We know this because people did not live in restriction alone. They lived with other restricted people. But yet she leaves her space in order to see about Jesus. Now, there were other restricted people, which means there were other colonized people living it with a colonized mentality, and they wanted to stay in their place because they had been told since they were small, I've got to stay in this place. But she made the decision to leave her restriction and see about Jesus. You see that there were other people, there were voices in her head, there were voices next to her said, don't leave, there's no use, I've tried it before, you don't need to go and do this, stay where you are. Why would you go to seminary? and spend all of that time. Stay where you are. You know, nothing's going to come up and no one is going to hire you. You're not going to be able to make any money. How are you going to make your ends meet? Stay where you are. Stay restricted. But this woman makes the decision to leave restriction. And here is the beauty of this idea of what she did. If nothing else happens, even if she is not healed in any way, shape, or form, she was at least not living in the same space where she was. You see, even if I leave restriction, at least I've got some new scenery, even if I don't get healed. At least I can see a new sky and a new rainbow and even a new river. I've left the place where I used to be. You're going to continue to see what you've been seeing, but at least least I see something new. You may not be healed from that which you believe you should be healed from, but at least God will give you some new scenery, which adds to the possibility of what you can see in your future. Leave your restriction. And that is the radical nature of this woman. She decides to leave, even though there were 
20, 30, 40, maybe hundreds of people telling her, stay where you are. But, but that's not even how, how radical this woman is and how amazing this woman is. And, and in reference to ministry is that she leaves restriction and she decides to touch the hem of Jesus's garment. Now, now, many people always miss the fact that when she touches the hem of Jesus's garment and we get excited that she touched the hem of Jesus's garment, but we miss out that Jesus had a bunch of armor bearers. For those who are in the Pentecostal tradition, the armor bearers within the African-American tradition of those who particularly protect a particular person from someone else. And so the disciples were around Jesus, protecting Jesus from everybody trying to get to Jesus. Okay, you still missed it. So here are the disciples, the people who've been walking with Jesus, know everything about his healing, have seen Jesus do miraculous signs, but they're the ones who are keeping other people from getting to Jesus. The ones who are closest with Jesus are blocking people's blessings. How often is it that one of the reasons that we are unable to get to Jesus is that we ran into somebody else who so supposedly had a close relationship with Jesus. And these are the ones who are trying to keep Keep, uh, people from getting to Jesus. How often is it that we have experienced this? And maybe we need to have some conversations, a whole nother uh, lecture, webinar, whatever, on disciples who have been blocking people's blessings. Mm. And, and so we see here that the men are doing the men thing. It's the patriarchy that's blocking this woman from getting to Jesus. They are standing there like armor bearers trying to say, mm, we don't want anybody to touch our Jesus. Isn't this interesting? They believe Jesus needs their protection. Is that not like the church? The church just thinks Jesus is so fragile. The church thinks that Jesus is just going to break, that if somebody gets to Jesus, we have to protect Jesus. But how do we do it? We don't do it physically. We do it with destructive doctrine that says you can't get to Jesus unless it's the way that I determine that you can get to Jesus by the doctrine that I have shaped that allows you to come to Jesus through the street that I have already plowed for you. But we see this woman is so radical she says there's another way to get to Jesus while you're standing up because they're doing the men thing. That's what armor bearers do. They stand up there, arms across, looking around, looking like security, making sure no one gets to Jesus. But watch what the woman does. In order to get to Jesus, she doesn't look the brothers in the eye, fuss anybody out, yell at anybody, cuss anybody out. She falls on her knees, puts herself in a position of worship, and then reaches her hand to touch the hem of his garment. Now, I can stop right there because that's shouting right there that she put herself in the position of worship. She didn't go over the top. This was not like football. She was not going left or right, trying to, you know, to juke somebody here or there. No, she falls on her knees and then reaches and touches the hem of his garment. Okay, you completely missed it. The radical nature of the woman is that Jesus never saw her. She forces healing in her life because she's willing to touch what has already touched Jesus. And how often is it uh, that we have really been have built a connection with the divine, a connection with God, a connection with the Holy Spirit, not because we had a direct relationship, but we were in contact with someone else who was already in contact with Jesus. That's the reason you are able to finish McCormick. It's not because of you, but there was somebody else who was praying for you long before you even knew what prayer was all about, that knew that you were going to do something magnificent and great. Someone who was already in contact with Jesus and you came in contact with them and it was, as a result, it changed your life. She touches the hem of his garment and literally the power flowing from Jesus flows into his garment and flows into her life. Now, if you look at the NIV or the New Revised Standard Version uh, translation, it says he felt power leave him. And that is when Jesus starts looking around, trying to figure out who touched me. And of course, uh, the disciples are always saying, you, how could you say who touched you? Uh, there are people pressing against you. He ignores them. There's a whole little comedy set in reference to how Jesus is just saying, here, talk to my hand. I know what happened to me. Uh, but here he's looking around and then he spots this woman and, and the woman falls upon her knees and tells him the whole truth. Begins to talk about the fact that doctors took advantage of me. I did not have the appropriate health care. 
I have been bleeding most of my life. I've been told that I was restricted. I was told that I would be nothing. I was told that I would not have any children. I was told that I could not be educated because I grew up in this particular spot. I was told I would never graduate from McCormick. I would not be a minister. I would never be ordained. I would never move up in any way, shape, or form in my denomination. Uh, she told him the whole truth with tears in her eyes. And then Jesus does something he's never done in scripture. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Now, now some completely missed what happened. So Jesus has said, your faith has made you well before. Mm -mm, you, you missed it. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. At the beginning of the scripture, it, when you read it, when you go home and read it, starts off as a woman with an issue of blood. In other words, she is only known by her issues. We don't even know her name. And you know that you are living on the margin of the margin when people define you solely by your issue. But now Jesus says, daughter. In other words, you enter into my family, daughter. And when you understand the relationship between a father and a daughter, I just dropped my child off at prom. And you understand that when someone makes the claim uh, that you're my daughter, all of a sudden you say that as a father within the ancient tradition and in the present tradition, if you mess with my daughter, you're going to mess with me. If you say anything to my daughter, you got to deal with me. You got to deal with me. You got to come through me because this is my child. Child. But, but wait a minute, still miss this because Jesus is not just talking to the daughter, the Jesus is also throwing shade at the disciples because the disciples have never been called son. They've always been called disciples. So in other words, the woman is elevated higher than the disciples. So higher than Peter, yes, higher than Mark, higher than Luke, higher than Nathaniel, higher than every disciple, higher than Paul, higher than any other disciple. So the next time we start talking about the one that Jesus loved, he must have loved this daughter more than any of the other brothers because she is elevated higher. So if there's ever been a moment when someone has said, that you are not to be called, you should not walk down that road based upon something. Remember that Jesus called this woman daughter, but I believe within the mind of Jesus, he was remembering the fact that when he was born, before a man could ever preach the word, God said, I've got to give it to a sister to carry the word. The first person to ever preach resurrection was a sister, and now the highest disciple we've ever seen is also a woman. So we've got a woman at the beginning of a scripture who births the word. We've got a woman in the middle of scripture who is elevated to a daughter higher than a disciple. And now at the end of the gospel, we have a woman who proclaims resurrection before anybody else. And so we have this person. She is now daughter. And so I say to everyone at McCormick, daughter, everyone at McCormick, son, everyone who has been called, you are the sons, you are the daughters, you are called to great things. You are not known by your condition. You will step out into this world and transform it. And I am so grateful that there are sons and daughters who are stepping forth from McCormick who will transform this world and you have nothing to lose. Take off the chains around your mind and your spirit and start a revolution in your community. We need your voice and we need your power. Daughter, son, do your thing. God is calling you right now because we have nothing to lose. May God bless you and may God keep you. We praise God tonight for that powerful message and we thank God for the messenger, uh, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III. Come on, you put some hands in the chat and just praise God, lift your holy hands up and give God praise for what God has done and for that powerful word for none of us have anything to lose. Thank you, Dr. Moss, for that very powerful, powerful word. And so I have been assigned um, to um, share um, the students from the Pan-African Student or or Organization all the students who are receiving degrees or certificates. And so tonight, we wanna to take the time to celebrate the following students 
from the Black Church Studies Certificate Program, Anita L. Andrews Coleman. Also, Cawthon Kareen Evans Alexander. Gregory Sean Hardaway. If you guys are able to pull your faces up on the screen, this would be a great time. We'd love to see your faces. Gus Hearn, Sylvia Snowden, Snowden, Robert Lewis, and Felicia Cooper. All of these students will receive the certificate from the Black Church Studies Certificate Program. We praise God for them. Next, we have a student who is graduating with a Master of Theological Studies. I'm not sure if she's on, Sierra Bates Chamberlain. She will receive a Master's of Theological Studies. The following students will be graduating with a Master of Divinity. Stephen Carl Baldwin, Mary Claire Kavai Bechet, Brenda Boykins Montgomery, Daryl Brown, Gary Foster, Douglas Gaines, Renee Goodson, Rhonda Hoskins, Kimberly Lewis, Abbasolo Mavando, if I pronounce your names incorrectly, I apologize, charge my head, not my heart. Robert Sharp and Dwayne Willingham II. And finally, the following students will be graduating with a Doctor of Ministry, Leverett Bryant, Robbie Craig, Ulyssa Clemens Rith, Troy Underwood, Joseph Coney, and Sheila Grant. We say congratulations to each and every one of you. We are so, so very proud of you, and we wish you the best on your journeys. Congratulations to every, I am so excited. I don't know about you, but it's just like if they were calling my name. So congratulations to everyone. Um, we also have uh, graduating, well, getting their certificate in Latinx uh, theology and ministry, Digna Peguero and Johan Peguero. Yes. Uh, Masters of Divinity. Jose Barrera with an honorable mention all the way from Phoenix, Arizona. And our, yes. and our very own Priscilla Rodriguez, Woo! Yes. Uh, who is also celebrating her birthday bash this weekend. So uh, please give her a, send her a text message, send her uh, some love in the email, let her know that she is very much appreciated. And we are so very proud of our very own Priscilla Rodriguez. Uh, it is my pleasure also to call out the names for global students who are also uh, graduating or in line to graduate this coming May the 7th. Masters of Theological Studies, Christine Chang. Yes. Master of Divinity, Dong Shang Kim and Duet Lying Sang. OMG, I am so excited. It is a huge class that we have graduating. Um, Doctor of Ministry, Young Jing uh, Chris Lee, Young Chul Choi, Anthony Hong, Jing Q Young. Joseph Kim, Jun Ho Kim, Jun Kwon, and David Park with a Doctor of Ministry. We say congratulations. An ecumenical Doctor of Ministry, Sa Thuang Lian. We could say congratulations. We couldn't be any prouder. At this time, there might be a few students who uh, would like to share some reflections, maybe one or two from each of the centers. 
You don't have to. Is there anyone that wants to share anything? Any of our graduates? Y'all shaking your head no, the ones that are on screen. <laughs> Uh, I have a few comments from a couple of them saying uh, they are still working on their assignments as they are, they are just about to finish. So we, we got to pray. We got to pray. Push them. Pray. Yeah. We're praying for you all. Well, if we don't have any reflections from our students. Um, I have a reflection. Okay. Um. It's very exciting to be now uh, be able to say Reverend Dr. Robbie Craig. Uh, it has been a wonderful journey uh, being at McCormick from the beginning of the first class to the last class. I can't tell you um, how exciting it was, the learning process and going through this journey. It was also very tiring. It was also very nerve wracking, but uh, Praise God, we can celebrate that at this point, I, I, I like what Dr. Ma said that uh, there's nothing that can hold me back. I'm not gonna let what people have said about uh, where you can go or what you can do be a hindrance to where God will take me and I'm willing to go as high as in the sky as God will allow me to go. And thank you for the opportunity to allow me to participate in this program and give me the understanding that I walk away with, which is very different from the understanding when I started this process. Amen. Amen. We also have one of the names that was not called, but it's my very own classmate uh, with a Masters of Divinity, Johnny Lawrence. So Johnny, we recognize you. In, in which I have to say, Johnny Lawrence is my niece. I was about to call ah! What happened if your name is not up there? <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad we got that rectified. In my family, me and my daughter will get our doctorate on May 7th, and Johnny, my niece, will walk the aisle together and getting her master's and my doctorate. Amen. A family that studies together stays together. You better get all your siblings, all your nieces, nephews. Uh, who else? Bring everyone in the family. Johnny, you're on camera, so, you know, you're tagged. So you're tagging me to say something. <laughs> uh, thank you for squeezing me in. I appreciate it, but I really do appreciate uh, this moment at McCormick. Definitely share with my aunt and so many other now brothers and sisters that I have. So the McCormick family is my family. All the professors that supported us, especially in trying times, you know, when people break their elbow from roller skating, um, all of those things. So I really appreciate each and every one of you, and I'm excited about the journey ahead. Thank you, thank you. We have time for one more word of thanks, reflection. Going once, going twice. If you are grateful and thankful, if you know that God has provided, moved some things around, people prayed you through, pushed you through, pulled you through, would you just identify yourself, raise your hand, put some comments in the chat, let everyone know that we are grateful. Um, as we are getting ready to close out, we um, have our Dean of Faculty, Steve Davidson here with us. And he will then give us the final comments and close us out in prayer. Thank you very much, Leslie. Thank you very much, uh, Stacy, Priscilla, the, the, the entire staff at our centers uh, for coordinating this event and the work that you have continued to do quite tirelessly over the 
over the years and, and bringing us to this event to constantly remind us of this great and wonderful achievement. So congratulations to all of you who are set to graduate in just over one week from now. Um, recently, I heard some very shocking statistics. Um, maybe they are, they, they are not that shocking to some of you, but the statistics goes that just under 40% of adults in the United States have a bachelor's degree. Uh, and, and, I, and I wanted to spend some time comparing it to other parts of the, the world, but the, the reality is less than half of the people in the United States have a college education, less than 40% have a college education. And most of us are in that group, in that minority, in that smaller group. So in many ways, we are part of a privileged group. But as uh, Leslie was just reminding us that we enter into that group, not necessarily on our own or through our own efforts, but through the collective efforts of communities and a whole number of seen and unseen individuals who get us to this place of achievement. Some of you are not only possessing a bachelor's degree, you're going to have a master's degree as well. Much smaller group. And one of the things that you would have recognized, that you would tend to recognize is that education makes you into a misfit in communities. You no longer fit into the communities in which you've come because you've been shaped into something else, something different. And in many ways, you start to see the world quite differently. And this is the responsibility to go help others get right. The world itself is not right. <laughs> you have discovered this. So part of your task, part of the duty, part of what that paper is going to mean, but the paper itself or part of the years of experiences that you have had with us in some ways, working with you, kicking and screaming to say, can you look at it this way? Can you perceive reality in this different way? Can this knowledge that you're gaining get you to think of it in that different way? It's all of it to get you right. So help others get right. And that's your task. Um, go, go back to your communities and, and, and in some ways help. And in, in, as Dr. Moss reminded us, bring that liberation, help people with the, to decolonize the mind and to get free. That's, that's the, one of the strong functions of education, freedom, liberation, claim it, share it. Congratulations and every blessing in your life and, and ministry ahead. Amen. So with those words, we say thank you. Thank God for all the ways that God has shown up and shown out. Thank you, God, for making us radical in nature so we can start a revolution. We say no to being restricted, but yes to being who you have called us to be. And it is in Jesus' name that we say Amen. 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 And amen. 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 Congratulations, everyone. Amen. This is when you open up your mic and you better. Amen. You amen. Congratulations, everyone. Amen. Congratulations. 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 Amen. 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 Yes. Be blessed. You Thanks, all have everybody. a great evening. Have a great evening. Good night. Everyone have a great night. evening. Good night. Amen and amen. Good night. Good night. Praise God. Good night. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah.